Aha! Hello, today I, the Roman Centurion, am back. So today we are talking about women in ministry, the whole Mike Winger conversation. We are talking about whether women can be elders in the church, what Paul meant by this. Today we are going to war. We're going to war with the other side. Not really, actually just kidding, because guess what? This is not a competition. This is not a war. This is not a fight. You can, you can throw your swords away because today we are having a friendly conversation, a, uh, a discussion of, of what the truth is of what Paul is teaching in first Timothy three, among other passages. So let's get into it. Put your thoughts in below. Um, don't just listen and, you know, don't confuse truth with the 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 Philly good feeling you get when someone on your team says the you know something you agree with. No, don't confuse security with truth. Let's let's we're all on the same team here. We're coming together. We're just trying to figure out what the best way to understand Paul is in the Bible. So, first passage. Um, well, not specifically a passage, but. Uh, so this is, of course, Taryn Williams and Andrew Bartlett's uh, reviews of Mike Winger, a very popular YouTuber who um, did lots of research to, to see um, what the Bible said about women in ministry and, and these two people that have spent a lot of time uh, writing books and stuff like that on the topic. They wanted to share their thoughts and, and give a little bit of critique, critique, little discussion. So what Winger presently gets wrong about women leaders in the New Testament, Part A. So this was uh, Mike Winger's fourth video, but it was such a long video that they're breaking up the reviews. Uh, so first thing we do, uh, he gets into a discussion of something that actually was said at the very end of the review, where... Uh, uh, so Mike Winger, near the end of the discussion of New Testament women, Mike says there is a need for women's ministry throughout the church. If male pastors are going to fulfill all the roles that, all the needs that women have in the church, that's going to create all sorts of problems and affairs and insufficient ministry as men try to understand the needs of women. And them being the nice people that they are they say we agree with him that there is a need for women's ministry throughout the church then he says but mike goes wrong many times in his part four video on new testament women the video is over two hours long we will be selective and discuss five important topics where there are major errors in what he says we say this with a mixture of surprise and sorrow the, error, the errors are so big that we should probably use capital letters and call them major errors. They, they don't really hold back the punches in this one, as you guys will find out. That is not just because we disagree with some of his conclusions. It is because there are big and sometimes elementary errors in his research and reasoning, and he has misunderstood and misrepresented what other scholars have said. He gives a quick summary of Mike's views on the five topics. We will use true and false to show which statements are reasonably justified and which are unjustified. And then he cites uh, his book. Uh, you guys should, it's a really interesting book, had a lot of good reviews of it. So according to Mike, the qualifications for elders, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. Now, just remember, this is right after that passage where it talks about how women shouldn't be teaching or having authentic or authority, whatever that means specifically. But then it goes into 1 Timothy 3, 17, 3, 3 1 to 7, where, and then Mike says, where Paul sets out the qualifications for church elders, he's, which is the ultimate elder passage. Andrew Bartlett and Taryn Williams say true, they agree. The qualifications include ability to teach, true. The qualifications are masculine, saying the qualifications in this passage, Mike Winger thinks they are masculine. They, he says they plainly require that all elders be men, and Taryn and them think it's false. They, can st they constitute a very strong argument against the egalitarian position that women may be elders. 
They also say it's false, of course. And then number two, qualifications for women deacons, 1 Timothy 3.11. So this is right after the passage about elders. 1 Timothy 3.11 is a statement of qualifications for women deacons. And, of course, Taryn and them think it's true. Yes, it's definitely talking about qualifications for women deacons. And then they say, Underst or this is Mike Winger, understood in that way this verse proves that only men could be elders because there are no qualifications for women elders. And they disagree with that. Then church host Mike Winger thinks the, the egalitarian claim that women who hosted churches became church elders is not true. It is completely false and it is a serious, egregious, scholarly error. So Mike, this is a really interesting argument, but... Uh, Mike, as we will talk about, doesn't necessarily understand it, and therefore um, he te he tends to be more harsh on the the arguments that you know don't look as good to him or seem like false reasoning to him. Which obviously that makes sense, you know. If it's a really really bad argument, maybe you'll use harsher language. The problem is, of course, if you don't understand it, then you can end up being harsher than you should be. But of course, Taryn Williams and them say it's false. Then later, they talk about Priscilla and Phoebe. Priscilla, with her husband Aquila, taught Christian doctrine to a man they all agree with. Then Priscilla does not teach him with authority like an elder. And Taryn and Andrew think that's false. And then in regards to Phoebe, Phoebe carried Paul's letters to Rome. Everybody agrees that's true. And then Mike Winger says, despite the ESV's translation as servant, Phoebe was probably a deacon, so they both agree that's true. So Mike Winger's going against some complementarians on this position. Then Paul did not describe Phoebe as his or anyone else's leader. They also agree that's true. Finally, Mike says, the idea that the letter carrier would explain the letter to the recipients was not a real custom in the ancient world. There is no evidence for it, and Phoebe would not have acted as an authority authorized teacher explaining Paul's letter to the Romans. This idea is weird, Mike Winger says. Of course, they disagree with that as well. So we're going to get on to, into all this. They sum up the the mistakes that Winger made in, in the, the below bullet point list, he says, or Taryn and, and Andrew Bartlett, they say it's too, Mike Winger's analysis is too superficial examination of the Bible text being interpreted. It has an inadequate attention to literary and historical context. He, Mike Winger was is insufficient familiarity with New Testament Greek, that he was unskilled of use of lexicons for Greek, inadequate research, omitting to consider important opposing arguments, misreading and misjudging what other scholars have said and written, flawed logic or flawed reasoning from the text, oversimplification, misapprehending the chronology of events in the New Testament, and unevidenced or mistaken assertions about the historical realities of life in New Testament times. So those are obviously really big claims. We're going to dive into these very quickly. And uh, Taryn and Andrew say, it is painful to set out his mistakes like this, but the topic of women's ministry is important. We owe it to both Mike and to you, the reader, to identify the errors. And then they say themselves, Mike deserves a word of mercy about his mistakes. There are powerful factors that drive them, as we shall explain. So, they kind of get into a bit of a mindset idea, like how, how you're coming into the discussion, which is very important. So, and just for clarity, for simplification, whenever I'm citing something that Taryn or Andrew say, I'm just going to say Taryn, just because we're going to, uh, that's a lot to say, a lot of stuff that I don't need to say. But if I mention Taryn and technically Andrew says it, that's okay. It's not really that big a deal. Anyways, Mike makes, uh, so this is Taryn speaking. Mike makes severe criticisms of some things written by egalitarian scholars. He speaks with emotion and eloquence using words such as completely false, bogus, weird, egregious scholarly error. We, Taryn, says, we agree that what egalitarian scholars write is sometimes incorrect. The same is true of complementarian scholars. Things have been said or written which on close examination turns out to be wrong. This should not be too surprising. James's authoritative word is realistic. 
not which says not many of you should become teachers my fellow believers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly we all stumble in many ways anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect that's james 3 1 to 2. so they're basically saying hey yeah everybody makes mistakes but leaders will be judged more harshly it's kind of common sense then Taryn says, this important scripture reminds us that all Bible teachers are fallible and stumbles are ex to be expected. And discussions of the topic of women's ministry, on top of the ordinary fallibility of human teachers, there are additional factors which make the mistakes particularly frequent and particularly hard to correct. The discussion has become polarized with most participants being in one of two opposing camps, complementarian or egalitarian. And in the United States, especially, the discussion has become mixed up with a cultural war in a time of rapid social change. This tends to generate heightened emotions in a partisan mindset, us versus them. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's very true. It's, it's, um, I mean, it's it's very common reasoning. It's not specific necessarily to this discussion. Certainly a good point. It is, and, and to Nick, I am back. I am back. And this won't be the last time either. So everyone be on their best guard. None of that Christian funny business. That was sarcasm. Of course, I'm a Christian too. All right. It is, um, he's, so Taryn Williams says, it is an observable fact of life confirmed by studies of cognitive bias that a Partesian mindset tends to magnify, tends to magnify misperceptions of evidence, absence of good listening, reliance on weak arguments and other misjudgments. What makes it even harder is that many scholars and pastors have heavily invested publicly promoting a particular viewpoint or are in seminaries or churches where any questioning of the accepted view would result in dismissal from employment. In such circumstances, it is very, very hard for people to examine scripture without being strongly influenced by partisan preconceptions. These difficulties are sometimes further aggravated by conscious or unconscious feelings about the direct personal implications of what is taught. Men can feel insecure and defensive. Women can feel belittled, belittled or patronized. This is a very good point. So both people on both sides of the aisle have to be very conscious that their emotions, what makes them feel good or not feel good, doesn't prevent them from truth. We have to be very careful about that. And this is, of course, very worth mentioning. So a lot of times in these discussions, the egalitarian, egalitarian scholars, you know, they really, really want women to be, you know, some type of leadership role. So they will, they'll confuse that good feeling with, with the truth. And so as well as the complementarian side. So it's, it's nice that they, they also recognize that women can feel belittled or patronized. Uh, so we have to both, both sides of the aisle have to, to really understand the discussion. All of these human reality, realities need to be kept in mind when we are assessing scholars or pastors' arguments on the topic of women's in ministry. Here are some reminders that may be useful. He says, in this climate, it, could, it becomes all the more important to take great care in using sound methods of reasoning, basing one's conclusion squarely on the words of the Bible's text, assisted by relevant historical evidence. This is what Mike tries to do. Yeah, so uh, regarding this first one, that's, that's nice and dandy at all, but it's not really great application. Like, of course, everybody is trying to use sound reasoning, and nobody's ever going into it thinking, oh, am I... Like, even if I said, hey, if, am I using sound reasoning in this situation? You know, that that isn't enough to show why your argument is wrong or that you're, you, you know, being affected by your bias. You need a little more than that. Uh, so next he says, there is a pressing need for humility and calm. We all have much to learn. We cannot always be sure. We may be wrong. We all stumble in many ways. So we must listen to one another very carefully and judiciously weigh what is said. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This is James 119. Mike tries to do this also. So they're they're nice and credible to Mike. They're not explicitly saying, hey, this is what Mike is doing. Then they say, when one is assessing 
controversial claims, partition argumentation produces a particular practical difficulty which has had a noticeable adverse influence on Mike's videos. Derived from Andrew Bartlett's experiences as a lawyer, judge, and international arbitrator, he gave the following brief explanation in his 2019 book. He says, appreciation of the other side's point of view is made much more difficult when they deploy weak arguments because of their firm belief in their own position. They tend to underestimate the weakness of their poorer arguments. Accordingly, they overlook the negative impact of those arguments, which is to make it hard for the opposite side to hear their better points. Right, so a wonderful example of this is a lot of times when, when we'll talk about like a, a review of another video, it's very, very easy to watch an entire video, point out two or three things that weren't like good points, and we just happen to ignore everything else. We have to make sure that we're taking all of the data in because even if those poor arguments, if we throw those out, it doesn't necessarily mean that said either side is is right about the discussion. We we can't just focus on the the bad arguments, you know, because because it makes us feel good or whatever. Uh, so next in in the book, Andrew Bartlett says a judge needs to be on the alert when what is served up for consideration is unpersuasive. The fact that someone presents poor arguments does not show that they are in the wrong. Their position may be justified by good reasons which they have not thought of or which have become obscured among the dross. In the same way, when wrestling with the interpretation of scripture, we must not let the weakness of scholars' poor arguments distract us from seeing the force of their stronger ones. Very true. So uh, let's see how they tie that in with Mike. In short, people arguing a partisan case often state an argument badly that makes it easy to reject it because the argument is obviously false. But this should not lead to the automatic rejection of the partisan's position. Sometimes a better argument would establish it. So the, uh, Andrew and Terrence say, several times in his series, Mike states candidly that he saw so many weak arguments on the egalitarian side that their poor handling of scripture depressed him. It is clear that this made it hard for him to hear their better points. The weak arguments have distracted him. The adverse effect of this phenomenon was further increased by occasions where he mistakenly thought that their arguments were per poor because he misunderstood what he was reading. And of course, this has a, a a funny little effect because if you well if you come to the conclusion, hey, the people you're reading probably aren't that smart or they're they're not good arguments. Well, you're going to spend less time reading it. You're going to spend less time studying it. And not only that, but you if you spend less time studying it, paying attention, then one, if you do find their argument. If you actually do able to read it, then, and you already think it's going to be bad, well, then when you misread it and you conclude, oh, well, of course it's bad, you know, because you've misread it, well, that totally fits the thing because it's like, well, of course, you know, people of this position typically make bad arguments. But oftentimes it's it can be really important to ask, hey, like if an argument, like, like most times in these discussion, an argument that somebody makes isn't absolutely absolutely terrible like if it, it like if i'm ever reading something and i say oh my goodness that is so obviously incredibly false rarely these people are like stupid and unless if they're like completely idiotic and like crazy they're probably not gonna be making this argument typically what that means is i've misunderstood it and but the problem is if that you actually think that the people you're critiquing don't have good scholarship then you're not going to ask that question and that can make things really difficult so uh, probably went into too much detail that's okay there anyways so let's keep going and Taryn and them say, in his part one video, why can't we think biblically about it? Mike identified what he called seven huge mistakes that people make in the way they approach the question of women in ministry. Disappointingly, he overlooked a number of mistakes which he himself has made, including the mistake of being influenced by the fact that in a partisan debate, people use poor arguments. Throughout his series to date, he is not successful in guarding against this. 
We emphasize, ag emphasize again that we are neither making nor implying any criticism of Mike's character as a person and as a dear brother in the Lord. Our criticisms are only of his reasoning, nor are we criticizing the spirit in which Mike approaches task. We gladly acknowledge that Mike knows he is fallible, and he repeatedly indicates that he's willing to receive pushback from his audience, and he tries hard to be dispassionate in his analysis. That is clear from his frequent and carefully explained disagreements with poor arguments put forward by other complementarians. We commend him for all of that. Like Mike and like every other scholar or teacher, we remain learners. If you find some mistakes in what we write here, we will be pleased to receive correction. And and that goes to me too for me too, because I, I can tell you for sure, like, yes, critiques don't always make you feel good. At the same time, for my specific position and someone like Mike's position, it's extremely important that one, we represent people, and sometimes it's hard to represent people correctly. So you guys' feedback is extremely helpful for that. Two, we obviously, if we're gonna be in a t teaching position, if, if lots of people are gonna be relying on us for correct information, for the truth, then it's very important that, that we have sound reasoning. So that is why I really do appreciate feedback. Now, the problem, of course, is that if you ask for feedback and you don't have a high opinion of the people that are responding, well, you're going to spend less time caring about their feedback. So you might say, hey, I want feedback. But then when people give feedback, it's like, one, it makes me feel bad and not pointing any fingers at anybody here. But one, it makes me feel, you know, the hypothetical person feel bad because it's like critique, like and it makes people feel uncomfortable. But two, so that's one, you know, so, good. so the first one is if you're uncomfortable, then you're obviously going to spend less time thinking about it because you don't like that good, that bad feeling of being uncomfortable. But two is if you have a low view of the people that are critiquing you, well, then, you know, you're just going to not spend as much time on that. So that is one problem that I, I have mentioned with or my, understood with Mike is that, you know, he's like been asking for feedback, but then like multiple people have um, given him thoughtful ideas and, and responses. And like he spent very, very little attention or care or anything like that in and actually correcting on anything. Like, I mean, this is a huge series. Like, of course, we're going to make mistakes, right? So, I, I, you know, you, you'd think someone would be a, a little bit more careful about that. But he's got a big, he's got lots of stuff to do. You know, that's, that's his prerogative. He's, he's no obligation to to correct himself or anything like that. So anyways, uh, so this is, um, so they later say, now we turn to the five topics in order to explain what Mike has got wrong. Qualifications for elders. We'll begin with a quick summary of where we are heading with 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. So they're describing Mike's view and then their comment on it. So they say Mike's view, which is that Paul sets out here the qualifications for elders. It is the ultimate elder passage. And they agree that these are the most complete and explicit instructions about pointing to church elders. This is actually going to be very important later because if this is the ultimate elder passage and you can't conclude that women aren't allowed to be elders from this passage, well, that makes things really awkward because this is supposed to be the ultimate passage that we're supposed to be you know, listening to the, the most explicit instructions. So that, that's an interesting point. I wonder if they will actually mention that later. Next, Mike says, the qualifications are masculine. They plainly require that all elders be men. And then uh, their comment is, this is a common misconception derived from the influence of traditional English translations. It is not correct. And I will add that it is plainly not correct. Uh, so that's really interesting that he uses the word plainly, and I do as well. Anyways, Mike also says the qualifications include ability to teach. And Taryn says, correct, but the qualifications are not compulsory requirements. They are indicators of suitability. So in other words, this passage on 1 Timothy 3, it is not absolute statement on what is required of somebody to be an elder. So you don't specifically need to be able to teach or to teach it is rather they are indicators of suitability we will get into that later then finally winger um, in their little chart here of summary 
winger's position is the qualifications constitute a very strong argument against the egalitarian position that women may be elders. And Taryn responds, not so. The reverse isn't the case. If Paul had meant to specify that elders must be men, he wouldn't have said so plainly. He did not, whether in this passage or anywhere else, nor did Peter or any other New Testament apostle or teacher. So basically, in this passage, Mike Winger thinks it's a very strong argument against the egalitarian position that women may be elders. And they say, uh, no, it's not explicit at all, nor is it in any other passage. So uh, they go on to say, Mike proceeds on the basis of treating the New Testament terms elders, overseas, and pastor teachers as for practical purposes, all meaning the same thing, people tasked with overseeing and shepherding a particular local community of believers. While there are nuances that could be explored, that is good enough for the purposes of the present discussion. And in the footnotes, they say, uh, Taryn says, it seems reasonably clear that every overseer, episkopos, is an elder, presbyteros, but there are differing views on whether every elder is an overseer, and it may be that pastor-teacher could be either a locally-based elder or itinerant. So in other words, if you see the words for elder, overseer, pastor-teacher in the Bible, in the New Testament, what Mike is saying, hey, they're they're pretty much the same thing. Hey, Donald. All right. So before we look at Mike's reasoning, it is helpful to know about four features of the Greek in 1 Timothy 3, 3, 1, 2, 7. And before we get into that, I did want to actually re look at the passage just very briefly. I definitely came prepared. Don't you think otherwise? All right. So, um, so that yeah, as I said before, this is right after that whole women authority type thing with teaching. Uh, but in this context, he uh, Paul goes on to say, "Here is a trustworthy saying: Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled." So then he gives a long list of things that an overseer would be good to have and then next in the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect and then later in the same way the women are to be worthy of respect and those two things there's a little debate about what those explicitly explicitly mean there and then finally a deacon must be faithful to his wife and manage his children so we will also talk about that is that exclusive for women and or is it just men we will definitely talk about that so, the the first word is the use of tis. The passage begins with, if anyone tis desires to be an overseer. So, let's look at the, the Greek real quick here. So, yes. Okay. So, technically, it's not the very beginning. But, uh, it's this word tis, and in this translation it is anyone. But, sometimes it can be translated as uh, any, any man or something like that. Uh, but, uh, yep, so that's that's what that word is. The word tis is the indefinite pronoun. It is usually translated as anyone or someone, and sometimes as a certain person. In regard to men and women, it is entirely gender neutral in meaning. Uh, let me put that caveat that what I said earlier about it could be uh, any man. Uh, I should be right about that, but I don't want to don't don't just take my word for it there. Anyway, so they say this use of tis is important. If Paul had spent meant to specify that only men could be elders, it would have been natural for him to have started with a word with a male meaning as if a man desires to be an overseer. So we'll go back here. He starts the passage. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever so instead of whoever, it would be if a man aspires to be an overseer. And, and what Taryn is arguing is that that's what we would expect if it was specifically about a man. And then uh, Paul said, it would have been natural for him to, to have started with a word with a male meaning as if a man desires to be an overseer. Paul use, Paul's use of tis is doubly important because of the context. If we look at Paul's immediate lead into what he says here in 2.8, which is the previous chapter, Paul's talking about men 
and in 2 9 to 5, or 9 to 15. So in 2 8, it's about men. 2 9 to 15, it's about mainly women. Given it in this context, it would have been not only natural, but also essential for Paul to commence with a clear signal that he was switching to talking about men and only men, if that had been his intention. But he continues in 3 1 with any if anyone which is the word tis thus it sounds as if he is intentionally introducing the qualifications for eldership with a word that applies both to men and to women and jamie says all we need to know if it is active or passive and if it is masculine or feminine and then we will know and that they're talking about grammatically active and passive this is a joke because in, in past discussions with James White, it seemed like some people were saying that grammatically active or passive means that it is semantically active or passive, and that changes the conversation. So basically, it's just like, oh, we have to know if it's, if it's grammatically this or that, then we're good. But that is not true. Good catch, Jamie. Anyway, so similarly, Partway through the list in verse 5, as if to re-emphasize the gender neutrality of his intention, Paul uses this again, for if someone. So, uh, let's go back to the Greek, actually. So, it's verse 5. We're going to go down here. If, but, one. So, in this translation, they actually use the word one, not anyone, but one. So, that's interesting. All right, so that so feature two, the idiom, one woman man. Here they say the second qualification mentioned in verse two is that an elder must be a mias gunakais or gunaikos andra. This is a Greek idiom. Literally, it reads a one woman man. It refers to a sexual chastity that is a compliance with the Christian ethic of only engaging in sexual intercourse within the marriage of one man to one woman. It is not a requirement of maleness and of being married. This will become clear below. So this is obviously a very important one because if you are reading this as a 21st century reader and you go along here and you're you're reading along and then you see it says where is it gosh um yeah okay this is actually it says faithful to his wife okay yeah that that'll work um so the now the overseer is to be above reproach faithful to his wife so that's a little different than one woman man but of course like if i said hey Gina is faithful to his wife. That doesn't really make much sense, you know, if, if Gina's a woman. So a lot of people say, oh, okay, well, this must be about only men because obviously women can't be faithful to their wife. Well, no. Taryn Williams is saying, hey, watch, watch out real quick. It is a Greek idiom. We'll get to that later. Then feature three, the convention of using male terms for mixed meaning. Where a Greek writer wishes to refer to both men and women, a standard way of doing so is to use an appropriate noun for males. For example, the Greek word for brothers, which differs in form from the Greek for sisters, can be used to refer either to men alone or to both men and women. The same is true of the Greek for man, adult male, which is used in the expression one woman man. And uh, yeah, we can go ahead and read this. So. They're, they have a footnote here. The primary meaning of aner is a male adult, but in Acts 17, 22, Paul uses the plural expression andres, or andres athenoi, men of Athens, to address a mixed audience at the Areopagus. For in verse 34, Luke reports that a woman named Damaris was among the andres, men, plural of aner, who believed Paul's message. The same word aner is used gender neutrally in the singular in James 1 8, 12, and 20 for the gender, gender neutral context. See 1 5 Tis and 1 7 Anthropos. For further discussion, see their book or his book, whichever. Anyways, so, so here Paul's masculine expression, a one woman man, could either refer specifically to a man who is chaste or it could encompass. Also, a woman who is chaste. We must be guided by context. So, grammar does not solve everything, everybody. Sad to see, but if only it were that easy. Anyways, 
English speaking Bible readers sometimes struggle to comprehend this convention of using language that has a primarily male meaning in order to refer to both men and women. So perhaps an example from a modern language may help it to make it clear. In France, if we have a group of five male friends, we refer to them as, what is that, ils? I don't know French, maybe someone can help me here. Which means, ils in French apparently means they, which is masculine. And then, and ah, miss, which is friends, masculine. If we have a group of five female friends, we refer to them using different words, elles, which is they, feminine, and amis, which is family, female friends. But if we have a group of friends consisting of five men and five women, the correct way of referring to them is ils, which is they, masculine. So it's a masculine word, even though it could refer to multiple men and women. And as I miss friends, which is also masculine. The use of the male terms does not tell the reader whether the friends are all male or a mixed group. Only clues in the context can answer that question. The Greek of the Bible works in a similar way. So here, if only women have been in Paul's mind, then he would have used the female version of the same idiom, a one man woman, as in 1 Timothy 5, 9. But the male form, one woman man, intended generically works for men and women alike. So the question is, of course, what's the evidence for that? Hopefully we'll get into that later. What is the context that guides us here? It includes the fact that Paul was talking about mainly about women in 2, 9 to 15. The use of the, so basically to sum up with that, he's, he's previously been talking about women. So to continue generically without being specific about whether it's a man or a woman, he's saying, that would be uncalled for. So the the context would seem to say that, hey, it is gender neutral. And then B, the use of the gender neutral word tis to introduce the list in verse one, the absence of a plain statement that only men may be elders, the repetition of tis to continue the list in verse five, the fact that other 16 desired qualities or behaviors do not indicate any requirement of maleness, but are all appropriate for both men and women. And fine, funnily, F, Paul's avoidance of male pronouns and possessives, which we explain next. So what does he mean by this avoidance of male pronouns and possessives? It says, feature four, the apparently deliberate absence of male pronouns and possessives. Seems a little uh, repetitive. That's okay. There is an important difference between Paul's Greek and those English translations which follow traditional readings here. We'll take ESV and as, as an example. In these verses, we read he, he, his, 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 he, 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 he. It's almost like they're laughing. In parentheses, seven male pronouns and three male possessives. None of those is in Paul's Greek. So that's an interesting point there. There are precisely zero male pronouns or possessives in this passage. So let's let's go into that a little bit here. So uh, let's let's look at the passage here. So the way that they get these male pronouns and possessives is because uh, things like the verbs will will have like a is it the verbs whichever the cert certain words will be mas masculine and therefore based on the context the translators of the ESV will say hey you know since it's masculine and usually when it's a masculine like this that means that it's referring to men so they will put it in there but if you if you look through this list like for this specific translation and and just just to let you know in their linears are not like somehow the the magical word for word translation or anything like that they're still interpretation in it. but in this specific translator's mind they they have here Oh, need to fix that mic, silly goose. What are you doing there? Yeah, yeah, hit the, hit the thumbs up, y'all. Whoever hits it up the most wins a prize. So, yeah, they, anyway, so you'll see here that, um, they're, yeah, one, they're not translating any any he or, um, the, the only male thing that they have in here is where it says, oh gosh, the husband, which is, is Andra, um, but that is also part of the, the idiom that Taryn is, is arguing for. But if you look at the ESV, 
Where's that little guy at? Yeah. So the, the ESV, it will say he, it'll say he, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up. So let's find a good example. So he desires a noble task. And we'll go here. If anyone overseership aspires to of good a work, he is desirous. Now that's a word, weird choice, a uh, weird word choice. But uh, we would expect to see the word he, he desires, he aspires to. We would expect a he here if they were going to translate it that way. And of course, you don't, if there was some type of like pronoun in the Greek, they would put it up here, like you don't, between Epi episkopos and origatai. But they don't uh, because the, they're getting that he from, from looks like the verb in this situation. I hope that makes sense. So uh, we'll keep going here. If one were back translating the ESV of verses four and five into Greek, the expression his own household would become rendering literally the one, the own household of him. So that's, you know, weird Greek. But Paul's choice of words here is the own household. So without explicitly showing it in the Greek, he's basically saying, hey, like, yeah, if we're translating extremely, extremely literally without any assumed use of pronouns or anything like that, it would be just the own household. Um, but the because the ESV, they, they see reasons to think that it should be about only men specifically, they will throw in he in there. And then, and ESV's expression, keeping his children submissive, would become rendering literally having children of him in subjection. But Paul's choice of words here is having children in subjection. Exactly. All the cool kids do it. It seems that Paul is actively avoiding male pronouns or possessive because he is thinking of both male and female candidates for leadership or eldership. And uh, he cites a situation where it seems like they, they're also avoiding that. But um, so, yeah, basically he's saying that, hey, you know, all these gender neutral words here that Paul looks to be avoiding male pronouns or possessive. Now, the problem with that is that oftentimes in, in a language like Greek, the, the the male pronouns and possessives can be assumed because because of its its gender language essentially. So while it might be grammatically gender or grammatically male, because of the way that it is, it, oftentimes it can be assumed in, in how the language is spoke. So simply them not being there doesn't necessarily mean that Paul was avoiding it. With that being said, it is really interesting that, you know, he uses words like tis and and isn't explicit. And there's there's one main explicit use here, which seems like which is the, the idiom, the husband of one wife. But we'll, we'll see if that, that's got any legitimacy to it. So some modern translations accurately take into account the above features of the Greek text. The result is that there is no indication in those translations that an overseer or elder must be male. Here is the CEB. So yeah, I mean, if you can pause it if you want, but it's basically just going over the translation. It doesn't say anything about a man or a woman. And uh, they even go into a little even deeper than that. Let's see. It says they should be faithful to their spouse. So they completely get rid of the whole husband or one wife idea. It's they, they translate it as they think that what that India means, just to make things more clear. The CEV does a, does a similar thing. But uh, the next question is, is so so that that is what Mike's, what appears to be Mike's main mistake there is that I guess maybe he read the ESV and thought, hey, that used a lot of he language therefore it can't be about women um, so that was a little confusing to me honestly because like like surely he's read all these other books that that make that same point that there aren't any explicit male pronouns in the passage but um you know that's because you know i'm sure he's 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 read why people come to that conclusion that there maybe there should be in there or like we should translate it as such but but yeah, that, that, I don't know, that was just really odd to see there. 
it almost like he just assumed it. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't fully understand what he was thinking there. Anyway, so uh, Taryn goes on to say, is the list legislative or indicative? The next important matter for consideration is the nature of the list that we are reading. We customarily describe it as a list of qualifications, but that description could be understood in different ways. We need to address the question whether the qualifications are definitive or indicative. In other words, is Paul meaning to lay down absolute requirements, which are compulsory, or is he giving indicators of the kind of people who are suitable for employment? So are these just general rules like this is what would be a good qualification or do we have to follow these exactly exactly as it says here just read the bible the husband a man um i'm i'm not sure what you referred to. if you referred to a husband of one wife um well th that's th that's what we're arguing that's that's a idiom um and that's if we're, uh, just for you know to spoil the beans on that one, Christosom, who who knew Greek much, much better than we do today, early church father, Christosom, said that that idiom was could be referred to a woman as well. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. There's more reason to think this could be about a woman anyways, or include include women. But, yeah, no, that you, you can't just simply say, hey, husband of one wife. Oh, that's it. All right. It's not all about men. All right. So. Anyways, let's keep going here. Evidently, the crucial character qualities in verses two to three are not to be read in absolute sense since there is no candidate for eldership is ever 100% perfect and being sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and gentle, and the gift of being able to teach is a matter of degree. So basically they're saying, hey, you you can't be 100% perfect. You can't. Nobody's 100% sober-minded, 100% self-controlled. Nobody is always respectable, hospitable. Now, these are general general things. And of course, they're also subjective as well. But then they say, then what about the more circumstantial factors in verses 4 to 7? Being a recent convert is a contraindication in this list, which is verse 6. Yet in Acts 14.23, Paul appoints recent converts as the situation demands. So in this in this um, First Timothy Chapter three, verse six, it says that, you know, it's not new believers, recent converts shouldn't be elders. But in Acts 14, 23, Paul appoints recent converts as the situation demands. And then only that in verse seven, it says, and outsiders did. Um, yeah, we'll just have to go to that one. Um, the, 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 yeah, we'll just go to that. All right. Uh, so what is that? Oops. Oops. Sorry, guys. Uh, chapter seven. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that may he not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. So, so they're saying, hey, these overseers must be thought well of by outsiders, people outside, I guess, the community. And, but, in in Acts fourteen twenty three, Paul does ex this explicit thing of of appointing recent converts. As, so it's, it seems what Taryn is arguing, hey, is depending on when the situation demands, that will depend on whether these specific things should be followed or not. Is it like if it is a specific situation, then you you don't have to follow these completely literally. That's what Taryn's arguing. So, um, um, and specifically with the whole outsiders things in verse seven. Um, Taryn says that it did not always think they did, you know, people outsiders did not think highly of Jesus, Peter, John, Paul, and other apostles. But obviously, those are high church leaders. There's there's no reason to say like, hey, like every elder ever must be thought of highly by outsiders. No, um, be, because clearly, like no nobody can a a uh, appease everybody, but. That did not qualify them from leadership of God's people. Through church history and still today, the list has been read as indicative of suitability. This is a letter written by Paul to a close colleague who would be expected to understand Paul's intent and apply it sensibly. This passage is not a church constitution setting out in a legal document a list of mandatory requirements for appointment to the eldership. Attempts to read the list as a definitive, that is a legislative 
lead to absurdities. For example, consider verse 4. They should manage their own household well. They should see that their children are obedient. If we, if we read this as definitive, a person with only one child cannot qualify because the word children is plural in Greek as, is, as it is in English. Nor could an unmarried person qualify if they follow the Christian sexual, sexual ethic because they will be childless. Yet, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul emphasizes how an unmarried person can give priority to the Lord's affairs because of their freedom from responsibilities as a spouse. And what if they do not have a household to manage because they are living with a senior relative or with a friend or have been engaged in itinerant ministry? Such a person would also not qualify. So these, these, these uh, you know, supposed qualifications for eldership they they have all kinds of exceptions where they would almost be silly for them to be rejected based off of that, like being unmarried, or which is something that you know Paul explicitly says, hey, it would actually be a good for you to be unmarried. But then it seems like on this other situation, they're saying, hey, well, actually, yeah, you do have, do have to be married in order, like that man. That would that would be rough. It's like man, you know, I I wanted to be an elder all my life, and you know, you 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 grow up there, and, and then. You're ready, you're prepared, but then, oh, nope, oh, nope. I I listened to you too strictly, Paul, in First Corinthians seven. I I was unmarried, but I didn't have I didn't have children, and I messed up. And then I mean, you know, you couldn't be married. That that'd be a little bit silly. Uh, why do you believe in fourteen twenty three that there are recent converts? Uh. Points recent converts as the situation demands. That's a good question. You you got me cold handed, red handed. I don't know. Yeah, let's look into that here. And this might be a good point just to skip. So, uh, if anybody knows in the in the idea why why okay so. No. That's a good question. Let's ask ChatGPT. Maybe they know quickly for me here. Uh, no. So Paul was, well, I don't know about, I mean, I, we don't have any explicit notion of Paul being an elder, but the, the point is that, like, it would be silly for, for this, him to have this arbitrary rule of you know these things that only apply to specific people and not like the highest authority or one of the highest people authority when when clearly like paul was at a position where he could have been a good elder that that is the point that is being made there all right um so forgive me here acts 14 Oh my gosh. All right, I'll just have to put it in the comments. Sorry, guys. Acts 14, uh, he doesn't explicitly note, and I uh, was not prepared to talk about Acts 14. So, well, actually, Acts 14, 23. We can pull that up specifically. Okay, uh, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed to the Lord and whom they would trust. So, okay, yeah, so... And verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned there, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom. And they said, Paul appoints elders for them in each church and with prayer. So the, these churches, they're new and they won lots of disciples. So then Paul and Barnabas appoint elders, people that are, that are new disciples, into eldership. All right. Yeah, yeah. so keep going here. Uh, outsiders did not always think of Jesus. Yep, yeah, we already talked about that. But that did not disqualify them from leadership of God's people. So 
Through church history and still today, the list has been read as indicative of suitability. This is a letter written by Paul to a close colleague who would be expected to understand Paul's intent and apply it sensibly. This passage is not a church constitution setting out in a legal document a list of mandatory requirements for appointment to the eldership. Attempts to read the list as definite, definitive, that is, legislative, lead to absurdities. I feel like we've already talked about this one. Uh... Yes. Okay, we'll we'll read it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we already did read this. Silly me. All right. On such a reading, Paul himself would not qualify, nor even the chief shepherd or Lord Jesus Christ. So, like, like, I th I think it would ab be absolutely crazy to say that if Jesus wanted to be, he could not be an elder, based off of First Timothy three. Like, surely they would have made, if even if this was supposed to be like a strict rule. Of like, hey, this is exactly what you you have to do to qualify. Surely they would have made an exception. Like that that is ridiculous to say otherwise. Um, so similarly, if one woman man were a definitive requirement to be male and married, neither Jesus nor Paul would have the, have the qualities required for eldership. God, uh, so Brother Allen says God's commands are never silly. We need to stick with God's word. Fourteen twenty three doesn't say the elders were new converts. God bless you. Uh, I appreciate your blessing. With that being said, of course, God's commands are not silly. The question is what God's word says. That is what's up for discussion here. 1423 does not explicitly say the elders were new converts, but it is heavily implied by the passage because in verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. And then it's, it goes on to say, and then they appointed elders. So I guess maybe you could say that, hey, it's not referring to the same people. There were already people there. Maybe. Um, I don't know. Let, let me know your comments. Uh, so we are not aware of any major church groupings, irrespective of whether they permit or restrict women's leadership, who read these qualifications in such a wooden way as compulsory requirements, as a, require, a reminder of the indicative nature of the list. It can be helpful to call the listed factors indicators rather than always describing them as qualifications. Uh, yeah, we don't need to get into that. All right. Scholars agree that women not excluded. Prominent complementarian scholars who understand New Testament Greek accept that the indicators in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 do not exclude women from being elders. The same applies to the parallel passage in Titus 1, 5 to 9. So this is very important because it's like, hey, you know, if even these complementarian scholars which, of course, Doug, Douglas Moo and Thomas Schreiner, they're not like middle ground in any way. You know, they're they are very, very egalitarian or sorry, very complementarian. You know, they're not it's not like they're, uh, you know, compromising or something like that. Um, but even these complementarians are like, hey, first Timothy three, one to seven is not good justification for 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 concluding that that, um, you know, women can't be elders. Uh, so he goes on to quote them. He says, complementarian Douglas Moose says that the phrase one woman man may mean that the male elder overseer must be faithful to his wife without excluding unmarried men or females from the office. It will be going too far to argue with th that the phrase clearly excludes women. And then complementarian Tom Schreiner says the requirements for elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 and Titus 1, 6 to 9, including the statement that they are to be one woman men does not in itself preclude women from serving as elders, right? So it's not that specific claim that excludes them. Uh, so um, I think that should be a like a big red flag if you're taking a position that says, hey, it should exclude them. Because like, why in the world would two people that are extremely conservative, why would they be willing to say this? What is making them con convinced about this position? Um, and then... Uh, they, they talk about John Piper and Wayne Grudem and and all these other ones, but I don't I don't see them that uh, influential or meaningful for most people. So we're not going to read over that. But they they go into Mike's first explanation. First, Mike describes the list as the exact specific requirements. It sounds as if he understands the list as strict strict legislation 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 there you go but this is mere assertion he does not provide any reasoning and support nor does he address the solid and widely accepted reasons for regarding the list as indicative which we have pre pre briefly laid out above rl all 
We're going to take a pause here because I can't speak. The centurion in me is confusing languages. That's what we're going to go with. So are all elders and pastors at Calvary Chapel churches like Mike's required to be householders, to be married, and to have two or more well-behaved believing children? Does Mike seriously regard Jesus and Paul as lacking the qualities that are needed in a church elder? We infer that he has not yet given serious thought to this question. Second, Mike notes that some say that the whole list is gender neutral, and he offers in rebuttal that the requirements are masculine. He says, he, the elder, is to be husband of one wife. So apparently he has no idea that, I, I guess the even arguments that it could refer to a, a woman, uh, that it could be an idiom. It seems like he's completely unaware of it. And then B, he is to be one who rules his own house well, or manages his own household, which is specifically male in the text and in the culture, according to him. In verses 6 and 7, the text indicates he, which is masculine. While many requirements are character-related and are also needed for other roles, the unique requirement for elders is able to teach because elders are the official teachers in the church. So that is Mike's, what seems to be his main argument. But Mike's rebuttal does not hold water. He does not discuss the meaning of the idiom, which CEB translates as faithful to their spouse, and he shows no awareness of the Greek convention of using male terms to refer to both men and women. He does not engage with the questions which the Greek text raises for us. Both of his points about the ruling of households are mistaken. In the Greek text, there are no masculine pronouns or possessives, and in the culture there were households ruled by women, especially healthy widows. As far as we can tell, Lydia, Nympha, and Chloe were all heads of the households. In any event, Paul specifically refers in the same letter to women ruling or managing their households, which is 1 Timothy 5.14. Mike's knowledge of the culture is deficient, and he has failed to take these scriptures into account. So yeah, it's, it's clearly above, audio, uh, above obvious to, to anyone familiar with that culture, anyone who's aware of this discussion, that there were very obviously women leaders of households, heads of households. Uh, we, I'm going to um, post a video about that with Nijay Gupta in these coming weeks here. So be on the lookout for that. But we talk about that idea of like women leaders in the, in the Greek culture of the time period. But if it appears, I guess, he might have misspoke or he just wasn't aware of that. A little odd to me. But anyways, his third reason, Mike's reliance on the word he, found four times in the ESV of verses 6 and 7, is an elementary error. It is hard to explain how this error arose, particularly since Mike indicates his awareness of scholars saying that the whole list was gender neutral. Right, so before he made this claim, he's like, hey, yeah, so the egalitarian scholars, they do think it's gender neutral. But if he do think if he does think that's what the egalitarians think, then why doesn't he address address those reasons for for why they would say that? And then um, Terence says to rely on the word he in English translations of these verses, one would have to be unfamiliar with the New Testament Greek, or would have to forget to consult the Greek text. One would have to simply disregard or close one's eyes to what scholars have written about. Yeah, I mean, really, really odd stuff. Then fourth, D, Mike's point about the responsibility to teach is unexplained and lacks supporting reasoning. If he is relying on his commitment to the idea that only men can be teaching elders, his argument is circular. So right, so I don't agree with this claim here. So if the claim is that Mike's argument is circular because he is uh, relying on these other texts, well, I guess I guess what Taryn's saying is, you know, like, hey, if you say that elders can't be women, and then, like, you can't use that as your reason for elders not being women. And that thinks, it seems like that's what Taryn thinks that Mike's argument is, but I don't think that's what it is. I think that maybe he's he's relying on these other texts from outside of the specific passage, something like First Corinthians 2, that says, hey, women can't teach or have authority, you know, according to Mike. And, like, that is... Fair, like, hey, if that is how we're supposed to interpret First First Timothy two, then we that's like strong evidence. Like, hey, maybe overseers weren't supposed to be authority, or or women weren't supposed to be overseers. At the same time, though, that that doesn't prove anything because if we 
have a like no there's no certainty in saying hey first timothy 2 12 is says like hey you know women can't be leaders or overseers there's no certainty in that we we could be misunderstanding that there's all kinds of different arguments even if you don't think like they're good arguments that you, you can never say it's like certain so it you could have enough evidence from first timothy 3 to overrule your your argument about first timothy 2. The point being is that Mike seems to be relying on these other texts or other things outside of 1 Timothy 3 to come to this conclusion. Terrence says it's circular, but it's not. If we evolve from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? You know, that's a great question. Tune in in 100 videos and maybe we'll answer that question. <laughs> um. So let's see. Yeah. So um, additionally, like even if there was another passage that said like, hey, women can't teach or something like that, women can't have authority, then, um, well, in 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching, which Terrence says, this implies that not all elders are active in teaching ministries. And the, the point is like, if overseers can't be women because they are required to teach or something like that. Well, first Timothy five seventeen shows that, Hey, you know, there, there are overseers that are not, or elders that are, are not teachers. And you could say that, Hey, like, okay, maybe the, the overseers that aren't teaching, those could definitely be women, right? You know, so it doesn't simply follow that. Hey, if you say that they were specifically teaching, overseers are supposed to specifically supposed to teach that it excludes women well you know that wouldn't be the case based on first timothy 5 17. anyways so even if mike were somehow right that a particular kind of authoritative teaching has to be by men the qualifications for elders still do not rule out women who are able to teach since they could be elders who do not undertake that kind of teaching moreover the Pris the biblical example of priscilla which we will consider in part B. So next next uh, article that we will read some other time, we will show that ability and responsibility to teach do not require maleness. Mike's third explanation. Third, Mike says that the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3 constitute a very strong argument against the egalitarian position that women may be elders. He mentioned several further points for supporting this. He says that 1 Timothy 3 can't be explained away by special circumstances or by women's lack of. Christian education, or by women being looked down on. But these remarks do not appear to relate to any of the actual reasoning relied on either by egalitarians or by complementarian scholars who acknowledge that 1 Timothy 3 does not lay down a requirement for male elders. And just to be clear, so we, we talked earlier about how, hey, like even complementarian writers say that 1 Timothy 3 doesn't specifically rule out male elders. So or it's about rule out women elders. So, so as I said before, you know, this is not like a me and you going back and forth in, in any way, or Taryn versus Mike Winger. This is this is not that discussion. The question is, what what is the best way to look at it? We're we're coming here together and we're trying to figure out the best way to look at it. We, we shouldn't be looking at each other as like as enemies. That you know, that's that's not the best way, not the best approach to look at it. Unless if you're me, who's the centurion who doesn't like any Christians. Unless if you're that guy on The Chosen. That guy seems nice. Anyways, Mike asserts that Priscilla, who did not... That was a joke, by the way. Mike asserts that Priscilla, who did not lack Christian education, was in Ephesus. But he offers no evidence that she was there when Paul wrote 1 Timothy. She had left Ephesus in the previous decade, no later than A.D. 57. Priscilla is discussed in topic four in part B of this article, and there does indeed appear to be a shortfall in women's Christian education in Ephesus, for in 1 Timothy 2.11, Paul instructs that women should learn. He says, what should we conclude? Superficiality and lack of research. The basic problem here is that Mike has not done sufficient research. He has not given close consideration to the Greek test. He, he has appears un, unaware that prominent Complementarian scholars do not rely on the list of qualifications for eldership as a sufficient basis for excluding women. He shows no knowledge of the widely accepted understanding that the qualifications must be understood as indicative rather than definitive. 
he has not understood or sufficiently examined the reasons why many scholars regard the list as gender neutral. It is disappointing that Mike's consideration of this centrally important message passage is so superficial and so full of elementary errors. In this video, he spends less than five minutes on it. And this is the really big point here. Okay, so like there's a lot of discussion on this, a lot of chapters and, and books written on this topic here. But he spent like five minutes on it. It's really odd. Like, and he says he spends nearly seven hours in another video trying to interpret what Paul says about men and women's head coverings or hairstyles in 1 Corinthians 11. And that is like such a far off topic. But like this specific is like very important. All right, let's let's address all of the arguments. Let's make sure that our, our audiences are aware of all the details here, that the main, the best arguments. And, and it seems like he's missed out on a lot of those. Maybe he wrote back, uh, you know, he, he missed his notes or something like that. Who knows? Um, but yeah, you know, like the, the main point, not to hate on Mike or anything like that, but the, the, the important thing for our, us listeners is like, hey, you know, one person, no matter how qualified, whether that be me or someone else, you can't just simply trust people that no matter how confident they are specifically, you can't just trust people that they're giving you all of the right details. And as I said before, that, that applies to everybody. Um, you should, and not only that, but you should question, even if you do trust them, you should still question the people that you agree with. So fundamental weakness. Uh, so this brings into focus a fundamental weakness in any complementary position on women's ministry in New Testament times. So he's basically like giving his case for like women and eldership. It cannot simply be assumed that women should be excluded from eldership or other forms of leadership. Consider these factors. And this is also extremely important because uh, like, you know, I, I got some feedback in, in our last, my, my, one of my videos with Nick Quint about Junia and Ephia. And like, hey, you know, you know, there's, there's these passages, 1 Timothy 2.12, and it's like, you know, women can't teach. Well, if you have one specific interpretation of one specific passage, and then you have books and, and all these other um, chapters in the Bible talking about people that were women leaders, it, you, like, a long list is everywhere you look, there's women leaders. And then you have one passage that says, hey, women can't be leaders. Something's a little off there, right? And that's why it's important to to look at these other people like, like Deborah. Like if she was doing the equivalent of what an elder was, but then you say, hey, women can't be elders. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, now that you know that's not an adequate justification, uh, summar summarization of, of the, the topic or whatever, but the point being that, like, if we have all these women leaders over here, and then we have just this one passage, maybe even two passages, that that possibly could say, "Hey, women can't be elders." Maybe we're misunderstanding the passage. That's what Taryn is saying here. So he says, even under the old covenant, some women were called by God into leadership of His people. For example, Deborah. You can watch our video on that one. Jesus contravened cultural conventions in his dealings with women and valued them as disciples when he was raised from death. Barely Protestant says, conflating leadership and ordination is really a rookie move. Well, good thing we didn't do that, right? So you're, you're not understanding the argument. So the, the point of the argument is that if you have all these things over here where people are doing this and then you have one passage that says women can't do this and you can even be more specific women can't do this and specifically a a a, a leadership role specifically a church duty that doesn't like like that that seems extremely arbitrary right it's it's only a specific church duty it it, it doesn't make much sense you know, you know, if it's God's word, of course, so we got to follow what it says. The question is, of course, what it says. Deborah was an elder. Right, exactly. I never said he was an elder or she was an elder. Uh, yes, yes, she was a judge. Correct. Um, all right. Hold up, guys. Let's let's actually just read the argument here. Um, apparently, my submission was not good enough. That's OK, though. We'll read it. Jesus contravened cultural conventions in his dealings with women and valued them as disciples. When he was raised from death, he revealed himself first to a woman, Mary Magdalene, 
whom he chose to be the first person to announce his resurrection, and he trusted her to make this announcement to his male disciples. At Pentecost, the Spirit was given to both men and women in fulfillment of prophecy to that effect. The apostles taught the equality of men and women in Christ. The apostles' conduct after Pentecost appears to have been predicated on the equality of women with men. For example, when Paul first entered Europe with the goal, or with the gospel, against convention he began his evangelistic work among a group of women. This was a remarkable action in ancient society. It affirms the value of women in the new Christian movement. Similarly, in his letters, Paul commends named women for their work, using the same terminology that he uses when commending some well-known male leaders such as Timothy. After Pentecost, the apostles taught that ministry was gift-based and that spiritual gifts were distributed among God's people. There is no statement in the New Testament that certain gifts were reserved for men. Churches initially met in homes. This raised the question whether the householder, who might be a woman, should be an elder. We will consider this below in topic 3. While first century cultures regarded the leadership by men as the general norm, we should not make the mistake of thinking that this was an inflexible rule. Even in wider society, the prevailing culture assumptions about leadership by men alone were far from absolute at any level. There were women who were exceptions to the usual practice. Women were leaders of local organizations, of provinces, and even of empires. So, even outside the church, it was possible for some women to exercise leadership. Indeed, some who responded to the gospel were leading women of high standing. In these circumstances, if there was to be a rule excluding women from leadership, it is needed to be laid down in definite terms and clearly communicated to the churches. Something so fundamental to the ongoing leadership of churches could not prudently be left to hints or ambiguities. If around 50% of believers were to be ineligible for church leadership, this had to be made very clear. Where better to communicate with clarity as a definitive rule than in the list of qualifications for eldership in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus, if we are going to find it anywhere, would it not be precisely there? But it is absent. The qualifications are indicative rather than definitive. And as prominent complementarian scholars candidly acknowledge, they do not exclude women. The rule is likewise absent from every other passage where it mentions local church elders or leaders. The rule is not stated anywhere in the New Testament. If such a were, rule were clearly stated somewhere, we would not be having this discussion. Because there is no definitive and clear communicated statement in the New Testament that women cannot qualify as elders, the only way of constructing a case for restrictions on women's ministry is by artificially joining the dots from controversial interpretations of disparate passages, none of which is directly addressing... Uh, you know 1 Timothy 2.12 is right before 1 Timothy 3, right? Yes, I mentioned that at the beginning of the, the, the conversation here. Uh, I loved you and Ben Hur. Oh, we'll, we'll have to do some fun review like that. Um, yeah, let me continue this here and then we'll answer more comments. The problem can be understood visually like this. Scripture does not provide a box which keeps women under restriction and prevents them from being appointed as elders. There's no such passage. So complementarians usually take two more passages which are not about eldership. Let's depict them as these two triangles. So two triangles. Let's, then they join them together to make the box like this. Sometimes they do not even do this, but instead concentrate on just one passage and argue that the restriction on women is implied. When they do, it is not 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 on which they rely. Complementarian scholars have devoted a whole book to the same question of whether women may teach or exercise authority in the context of a local congregation. The third edition is 411 pages long. The title is instructive. Women and the Church, an interpretation and application of 1 Timothy 2, 9-15. Eldership involves teaching and exercising authority in the context of a local congregation, but in this book, instead of relying on the qualifications for eldership in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, complementarian scholars labor to present an argument by implication from their controversial interpretation of 1 Timothy 2, 9-15 which is not a passage that is directly about eldership. They do that because the qualifications for eldership do not provide the needed support for their position. So it's possible that there might have been a typo, but I'm pretty sure they're referring to 2, 9 to 15, which, that yeah, that, um, that's not a typo. It's, it's referring like the authority and teaching. Um, women can't be doing that. So they're relying on 1 Timothy 2, not 1 Timothy 3. It, it's it's not that simple though. I mean, you, you got to read the scholarship. Barely Protestant. 
Of course, we'd still have this discussion. The pro women's or nation side would still insist upon their egalitarianism. I mean, I guess certainly some some people would, but it's not not really the point, though. Um, all right. Okay. Um, this fundamental weakness is one of the reasons why so many Bible-affirming Christians and Christian scholars are unpersuaded. If the apostles intended to ban women from leadership, they would have said so unmistakably in plain terms. The ban is notably absent from the most relevant teaching, the teaching which expressly lays out the qualifications for leadership. On the contrary, the wording of the qualifications appeared to open the door to women as well as men. The complementary case does not appear realistically credible. All right, so all the point of all this is, hey, so we, you've got all these passages where it seems like women are doing leadership type things, things that an elder would do, and then there's no explicit passage in the entire Bible where it says women cannot serve as elders. And that's really odd because that is exactly what we would expect. Uh, Lance Wren says, why can't 1 Timothy 2 and 3 be taken together? I don't understand why he's dividing the two unruly passages. I'm not dividing them. I'm, the question is, what is 1 Timothy 3 saying, as well as what is 1 Timothy 2 saying? You can't just assume that 1 Timothy 3 is saying something just because of your interpretation of 1 Timothy 2. Now, you might, you know, think that you should take a specific position, but it, it, there's a, it's a different conversation. You, you, we still have to figure out what 1 Timothy 3 says. All right, let's keep going on here. Um, a women deacons. All right, let's see how much time we have left here. This might be a long video, guys. That's okay. Everyone's going to love it. All right, so qualifications for women deacons. In 1 Timothy 3, the qualifications or indicators for suitability for appointment as an elder are immediately followed by the qualifications or indicators for suitability for appointment as a deacon. In 1 Timothy 3, 11, stands in the midst of the indicators for deacons, which commence at verse 8 and finish at 12. Verse 11 says, In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. There is considerable disagreement on scholars over the meaning of this verse, referring the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Uh, I think it'd be helpful to talk about a little, little bit of context here. So, First, so yeah, so it's it's going from overseers, and then it's talking about the deacons, and and then all of a sudden, in the middle of this, uh, verse eleven says something like, "Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers." And the question is, okay, like one, how do you translate that verse? And two, why does why why the standing out of the women there? So there's there's considerable disagreement. Uh, Terence says. But, um, and, you know, who are the women? Are they women deacons, believing women generally, wives of deacons, wives of both deacons and elders, deaconesses whose responsibilities differ from those of male deacons? The full discussion is complex. In this article, present, because we are specifically addressing Mike Winger's argument that church elders must be male, we will proceed on the assumption that Mike is correct in his interpretation that women in verse 11 are women deacons. Mike considers that Understood this way, verse 11 proves that only men could be elders. His reasoning is crisply noted in his notes. If we see women deacons in 1 Timothy 3, then how much more do we not see women elders in 1 Timothy 3? So it, it's in this, the passage after talking about the elders, talks about the deacons and explicitly says something about the women deacons. But it doesn't say that anything, like there's no specific mention about women elders in, in the previous passage. So what is going on there? Mike says, the deacon passage is so obviously about men that Paul must mention women separately. But it's the same sort of language that Paul used earlier for elders, masculine, without any mention of women. And of course, this reasoning is faulty. It repeats the quite mistakes about Paul's use of masculine language for elders. He has misread the qualification for 
elders in reliance on some English versions without closely considering the Greek text. He has not noticed the word choices and contextual indications which we have discussed above, which should signal to Greek readers that the elders passage applies to men and women. So the elders passage does not need an equivalent of verse 11 to show that it applies to women. And if Paul is meaning to speak of women deacons in verse 11, it is not hard to see why he mentioned them specific, uh, separately in verse 11. Let's employ some disciplined historical imagination, remembering that Paul is dictating. When he dictates, he sometimes momentarily interrupts his flow when he wants to provide clarity on something he has just said, as he does, for example, in 1 Corinthians 1.16. The starting point of the deacon's passage is not the same as the starting point of the elder's passage. In the elder's passage, the indefinite pronoun tis, which is the word for anyone, precedes the word overseer, indicating gender neutrality. But the deacon's passage starts in verse 8 with the word diakonos, which is deacons, plural of diakonos, usually meaning servant, without any gender neutral indicator, and proceeds to list some qualifications. This word for deacons is grammatically masculine, and so also the qualifications are also expressed in grammatically masculine form. In Greek, the fact that a word has a grammatically masculine form does not in itself indicate that the meaning of the word has to do with males. But grammatically masculine words, which refer to people, do often have a primarily male meaning, such as adelphos, which means brother, or aner, which means man. And this use of diakon diakonos as a designation of a recognized church office was a recent development in the churches. Perhaps because of the newness of the term, it seems Paul wants to make clear that he is talking about both male and female deacons. He therefore breaks into his list by indicating in verse 11 that what he has been saying applies to women as much as to men. He does this by repeating in summary form as applying to women, the point he has made in verse 8 to 10. All right. Uh, Paul then continues and completes his list in verse 12, which is intended to apply to both men and women, adding an encouraging comment in verse 13. So, assuming that Mike is correct that verse 11 is referring to women deacons, that verse does not provide any support for a conclusion that elders must be men. Moreover, we should pay attention to the wording of verse 12, which Paul evidently intends to apply to both men and women. The verse contains a second use of the expression one woman man, this time in the plural one woman men. This use reconfirms that Paul is using this expression in 1 Timothy 3 in a sense which indicates a criterion of sexual faithfulness for both male and female elders and deacons. This is because after what Paul has said in verse 11, both men and women are in view in verse 12. All right, so let's look at that real quick here. Okay, so, uh, so he's talking about possibly men and women here and then he specifically talks about wives and and then later he says let deacons each be the husband of one wife so in this context it seems like he's talking about both uh well i guess yeah yeah so um, is that what they're arguing let me see here I think this has to do with the the translation here yeah it is the esv so let's look at uh, another option here the the good old trusty net what we got here all right okay yeah so here's the long discussion about the, uh whether this is wives or deaconesses or all that kind of stuff so he's arguing that hey if this is referring to women, then in 12, he's already talking about women and men. So clearly, husband of one wife refers to both women and men. Now, it's important to mention that... Uh, do I have it here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so first Chrysostom and... Um, yeah, yeah, so first Chrysostom... First Chrysostom, that doesn't make any sense. Chrysostom, uh, early church father, he argued that... Husband of one wife in this passage right here refers to men and women. And it's it's almost the identical phrase as the original part. Um, I don't think he's going to mention it here. But yeah, so we have an early church father that knew Greek. Now, 
theoretically it's possible that they changed. It's possible that the the understanding of the word changed. But we have an early Jew, an early Greek witness that says, "Hey, this can refer to man and women." I think that is very strong for this for this discussion. So, in Greek, the fact that a word has a grammatically masculine oh no, we need to go back here. Okay, so anyways, moreover, we should pay attention to the wording of verse 12, which Paul evidently intends to apply to both men and women. This verse contains a second use of the expression one woman man, this time in the plural one woman men. This re use reconfirms that Paul is ex using this expression first Timothy 3 in a sense which indicates a criterion of sexual faithfulness for both male and female elders and deacons. This is because after what Paul has said in verse 11, both men and women are in view in verse 12. This has extra significance because of the parallel passage about elders in Titus 1, 5-9. There is no mention of deacons there. The list for elders in Titus starts gender neutrally with tis. If, as we understand, the one woman man idiom is properly understood as applicable to both men and women, then there is nothing left in the pa Titus passage which a complementarian interpreter could rely on as providing any indication at all that elders should only be male. Similarly, there is in Titus no equivalent to 1 Timothy 2, which complementarians rely on so heavily. Near the end of his part 5 video on women's apostles, women apostles, Mike revisits 1 Timothy 3, 8-13. He says this language is not gender neutral. He says, uh, I, I don't like the use here. He says this language is not gender neutral. Okay, so I, I, I te technically um, he's maybe referring to maybe he's citing Mike, but I think the, the more clear it is to say it is not grammatically gender neutral. There's there's a difference between like semantics and, and gender and, and like what the overall meaning of the word use, whether it's grammatically gendered or not. Anyways, that is formally correct. He agrees technically it's not gender neutral, but he misses the point. It seems that Mike has still not understood the Greek convention that male terms can be used to refer to either two men only or to a mixed population of men and women. Paul's language here indicates that the qualifications apply to both men and women, having provided the clue in verse 11 that he's talking about women, not only about men. Paul can use male language in verse 12 and the expectation that he will be understood as indicating qualifications for deacons irrespective of their sex. Chapter or Number three. Women, church, hosts as elders. This is one really, really fascinating. Do chicks dig puppets? That could be a serious issue your pastor isn't telling you. Yeah, that... I'm skeptical that... I'm. Uh, let me say this. I'm sure that there are women out there that love love the puppets. I do not know if my wife does. But that's, that's really awkward considering there's puppets behind me. But maybe that's why I stopped using them. <laughs> we will never know. Oh, random sign. Ah. Uh, no, all right, let's get back to it. So let's be clear. First about how this claim should be understood. When egalitarian scholars say that women who hosted churches became elders, are they claiming certainty? Or do they mean that it is probable that this was so? When they merely state the claim without explaining it, we cannot tell. But when they set out their reasoning, it is clear that they are talking about a probability. They do not claim that it is expressly stated in the New Testament that particular women hosts became elders. They argue, rather, that it is to be inferred from what is in the text and from historical knowledge of the responsibility of householders in Greco-Roman culture. The question is whether they're probably right or probably wrong. What is the most probable? And this is that really applies to everything. So I think maybe the confusion is like, hey, so people like Linda Belleville, they'll, they'll say something like, hey, yeah, this person was a... And, and a church host, a church host, and therefore she was an elder or something like that. Now that seems like that's a certain claim. She would never argue that it was certain, though. Um, but it, it's also kind of confusing when you do it like that. The I, I like to say like something like, "Hey, it is most probable," or um, you know, be a little bit more clear about that so you you don't give people the wrong impression. Um, so Mike very firmly rejects the egalitarian claim that women who hosted churches became elders. He judges it as not true. It is completely false. It is a serious, egregious scholarly error. So he's very serious about those. 
We gently suggest that Mike was here overwhelmed by the difficulty of overcoming the distraction of four arguments. His perception was that the case for women church hosts as elders was poorly argued, so he rejected it. But his perception was to a considerable extent mistaken, and he appears to have lost sight of the possibility that the case might be valid if explained to him more fully or argued more judiciously. So that's an interesting point. Like, say we have get, been given all of these terrible arguments, so many bad arguments for you know, I, I saw something online that was like, hey, you know, Jesus was fat. Like, that. that is, like, the, all kinds of verses you can pull. But, like, okay, so, say hypothetically, like, that is a bad argument. Jesus was certainly not fat, right? But, like, even if they give you all these bad arguments, it doesn't mean that he wasn't fat. It's just that means that you don't have a good reason to think that he was not fat. All right? So it is still a possibility. You just don't have strong reason. You don't have strong evidence for it. So even though I kind of just did that, um, the, we shouldn't be like, if like, if someone gives you like a bunch of bad arguments, it doesn't necessarily mean that that position is, is wrong automatically. There could be other arguments out there. So to like, to, to read a bunch of arguments and say, Hey, like, you know, those arguments are bad. Therefore it is just not true. It is completely false. It is serious scholarly error to make this claim. Well, I mean, that's probably not great words to use because it could be possible that Mike's misunderstanding it, which he would admit. It could be possible that he just hasn't heard the arguments, which he would also admit. So um, maybe clear language there could be helpful for, for I guess, for the audience at least. But um, so later, taking the example of Nympha, the text says, Give my greetings to Nympha and the church in her house. Colossians 4.15. So... Um, this is his reason. Um, what we're going to talk about is the reason why Mike doesn't accept this view. So the text does not say that Nympha was an overseer elder of the church in her house, um, which Taryn says is correct as far as it goes. The text does not explicitly say that Nympha was an overseer elder of the church. It is the agreed starting point for the discussion. The egalitarian argument draws inferences from the fact that in Greco-Roman culture, a householder carried a heavy responsibility for what went on in their own house. Of course, Mike disagrees with that. We'll talk about that. And just to be clear, so lots of comments in the in the chat, um, getting pretty lengthy video. So if there's anything that stands out, I'll, I'll make make sure to comment later on it in the comment section. But it uh, doesn't mean that you can't post your questions. If it's a really good question, I'll answer it. Uh, so uh, Mike's reason two, it is untrue that most commentators say Niffin was a leader. So this is a question of like popularity of scholars. Mike cites egalitarian scholar Lynn Kohick, who says, because the church met in her house, most commentators correctly conclude that she held some sort of leadership role within the church. Mike says he looked at 18 commentaries, of which only three gave some support to the idea of Olympus leadership. He put this forward as proof that Kohick's statement is wrong. He says, this is questionable scholarship. So he's... Um, it's, yeah, he's, yeah, like it is, that is a correct claim to say that is questionable scholarship, if that is indeed true, of course. With that being said, um, I, I try not to, I, I mean, I don't like to make those claims, and I've, certainly I do, I make mistakes, but I don't like to make the, those types of claims because it gives you gives your audience the impression like, hey, Lynn Kohik's a, a bad scholar or something like that. It might be that you're just misunderstanding them, right? And you, you don't want to misrepresent people and then, you know, make them look bad when you're just completely misle you're, you're risking a lot misleading your audience when you do that. That's I guess that's the main thing there. Uh, but so in other words, if you're going to say something like this is questionable scholarship, you got to be certain of it. Like you'd be really confident um, in, in my eyes, at least. It is fair to say that Kovic's statement could have been more fully explained, but it is Mike who has gone wrong here. He has misunderstood what Mark Kohik writes. First, let's notice that while Kohik refers to commentators, Mike refers to commentaries. So it seems like Mike misunderstood what Kohik was saying. Mike has experience of using Bible commentaries. He knows that Bible commentaries mostly do not say much, if anything, about the names at the end of a letter, especially if, as in the case of Nympha, the name is mentioned only once in the New Testament. Only a minority of commentaries will discuss the significance of such a name, and only a small portion will say more than a few sentences. No Bible scholar would expect to find, in most commentaries, a discussion and conclusion on whether Nympha, being a church host, was a leader in the church. So, like, yeah, if, if Mike says... Uh, Kohik is wrong because most people don't even comment on it, and the people that do, they they disagree. Well, like, 
the Koic wasn't referring to those people. And just because they don't speci- just because they specifically don't comment on it doesn't mean that like they they disagree with with what she's saying, right? Um, so indeed, that is exactly the picture that Mike found when he looked at his 18 commentaries. Very few of them explicitly addressed the question whether Nympha as a host was a leader or was not a leader. Moreover, Koic's expression most commentators cannot simply be intended to refer to both to most commentators as compared with all commentators. Those commentators who do not address the specific question, whether being a church host made Nympha a leader, are simply not relevant here. Common sense tells us that Kohik must be intending to refer to most commentators who address the question whether being a church host made Nympha a leader or not. Therefore, Ko- Kohik is indicating that most commentators who have written on that question have correctly concluded that Nympha had some sort of leadership role. But also, like, you know, it's certainly possible that Mike's commentaries that he's reading are, you know, they're not representative of the whole of scholarship. Anyways, so, yeah, yeah I mean, like, if I pull out my commentaries, my, my mainstream scholarly commentaries, and, like, you know, it's not like just, like, one super, super conservative group of people, and, and I looked at those, like, what would I expect to find? What, what? I would I would probably expect to find what Mike saw because most people aren't going to comment on it. But even if they do comment on it, they're um, like maybe if if then if they did, I get I guess the main thing is like hey, if you want to de- debunk uh, her claim of some kind, you're going to want to show like a not just commentaries. You want to talk about the papers that their people are writing. Uh, you're going to talk about uh, books. You're going to talk about um, and then specifically, like, commentaries of the entire patches, ones that actually comment on it. Like, if they don't comment on it, then it's, it's not really relevant for the discussion. Um, maybe I'm, I'm missing something there. But anyways, there were three commentaries in his survey which explicitly addressed the question whether Nympha was a leader in the church which he hosted. In varying degrees, they were all either positive about it or open to it. According to the details in Mike's written notes, none of the 18 commentaries explicitly addressed the question and then went on to reach a negative conclusion that Nympha though a host, was not a leader. So Mike's survey shows some positives and zero negatives. So at 12.02, Mike says 14 of the 18 say they don't don't include that she was a leader or so. Like, they actually deny it. She was not a leader, or they just don't even acknowledge it. We have not examined the 18 commentaries. However, judging from Mike's written notes, he misspoke here. His written summary says 14 don't conclude she was a leader or don't seem to think it warrants acknowledgement, even though they do speak in some def- detail about Nympha and the meaning of the greeting. His notes of what is in the in indiv- individual commentaries do not identify any commentary, which gives consideration to whether Nympha was a leader and then arrives at a negative conclusion. So what is the relevance to the audience listening here? Um, doesn't really matter that much. Um, so maybe Kohik is, is wrong about this. Maybe it's right doesn't really mean that much like it's certainly worth talking about but um at the end of the day evidence matters um so Stan right is Mike wrong wrong is he right doesn't really matter honestly um this is a minor point for the overall discussion like even if you like prove Taryn is wrong obviously that, that shouldn't or if you prove that Mike is wrong that shouldn't like maybe discount whatever else they say, especially. So anyways, is reason number three, it would make rich people the leaders. So if the, Mike is saying that if people that, you know, led the the house churches that automatically made him a leader, then it would make the rich people the leaders. And as Mike says, that the early church tended to gather in wealthy homes, but did not show the favoritism to the rich. Church leaders are not necessarily wealthy. That is more rare. That's what Mike says. They're not necessarily wealthy, but that is more rare. So, in other words, hey, you know, there's the Bible says like, hey, you know, no impartiality just based on wealth, and therefore, there wouldn't be like some, I guess, yeah, I don't want to go into more detail because he's unclear about like, why why would making there being rich leaders mean that, um, yeah, why why would suddenly this them being rich leaders suddenly mean that, um. Like the the you know the leadership wouldn't be okay with that because it's not like it's automatic that if you are are rich then you're going to be leading the church and if you're leading the church it doesn't mean you're going to be rich. Um, I'm I'm clearly missing something here. So Mike is right to say this. 
and see further first Corinthians four first twenty see further first Corinthians one twenty seven and James two one to five. But it is not a valid reason against women's hosting becoming elders. First, the villas of the wealthy were not the only meeting place for churches. Um, feel free to read that if you want. Um, that is an interesting claims. We would have to do more study on that because those are like some really big claims. Seems like, but but he doesn't give his his evidence for like uh, Priscilla and Aquila who hosted a church probably living in an insula, whatever that is. Second, and more importantly, whenever we have clear New Testament glimpse of local church leadership in a particular place, it is always plural, never a singular person. The egalitarian claim should therefore be understood to mean that the householder would become one of the elders in a particular place. To have one or more health wealthy persons included in the eldership would not be in conflict with anything that we see in the New Testament. Third, the result of Jesus' teaching about leadership and status, for example in Mark 10, was that a householder who hosted a church inverted their status and became the slave of all, making their home and resources available to serve the believing community. So even if they were the leader, it doesn't mean they would specifically like, like the, the goal at least would be that they wouldn't act like it. They they would, maybe they have the authority, but they would still act like lower than everybody else. But that's of course the ideal. That you, I don't think you can make a rule from that. Like, because of Mark 10, that the, all the people up there that were householders were, were behaving like they were lesser than other people. I, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's worth mentioning here, honestly. But before proceeding further, we need to note the limitations of the available evidence about the organization of the churches at the time when Paul was writing. In what we call the house model of eldership, we can envisage a plural eldership leading the assembly that meets in a particular house. In what we may call the city model of eldership, we can envisage each home meeting being overseen by the health householder host, with the plural eldership compromising all, comprising all the overseers in the city. Of course, a mixture of the two models is also plausible. I would have liked to see some more details of, of why people come to these two conclusions of eldership. So, for example, when we read Philippians 1.1 and see Paul's greeting to the overseers in Philippi, we do not know whether those two overseers were organized according to the house model, the city model, or a mixture of the two. Reason number four. Mike says, It is absurd to imagine a rule that if a group meets in my home, that makes me automatically the leader of the group. This is an interesting point, and I think this is the main one of contention. Mike makes this point because Linda Belfield, after citing what Colossians 4.15 says about Nympha, continues, while this is this is Linda Belfield, while the reference is brief, the implications are noteworthy. Patronage of a house church was an authoritative rule. The householder in Greco-Roman times was automatically in charge of any group that met in his or her domicile. That's in her book. We agree the rule, as baldly stated by Mike, would be absurd. Mike points out how ridiculous it would be if the Pharisee who invited Jesus to dinner became automatically the leader of Jesus' group, and he gives other examples of the absurdity. It is fair to say that this particular passage of Belleville's writing could be more fully explained, but the seeming absurdity could usefully have been made him pause to reconsider whether he had correctly understood what Belleville means. So yeah, right, so Belleville says a lot of different things, and some of them are very questionable according to Mike, me, as well as Taryn. But typically there's there's like some truthful, some logic in there somewhere. But like it would, I think it'd be absolutely crazy to say like every single time someone was a leader at the house and, and when they have people over, that made them the, the leader like of the church or whatever. Like, no, that, that, that's ridiculous. We um, So maybe if, if we come across ridiculous views, maybe that means like, hey, we're misinterpreting them. We suspect Belleville would have had the same view of the absurdity. If Mike had read more closely how her words continue, he would have seen the point which she's leading to this particular paragraph, namely, because of the complex nature of first century households, a female head of household would have needed good administrative and management skills. And Paul thus places great emphasis on a person's track record as a family leader, and as it is a definite indicator of church leadership potential. 
they cite First Timothy 3 and 5. As we understand it, therefore, Belleville is saying that Nympha became an authoritative patron, which is obvious from the New Testament context, being the provider of the venue for the church. So just to be clear, patron, they like they give money, they provide for the church. And as a householder, Nympha had church leadership potential. Those are the implications that are noteworthy. Um, and, and then now oh, this is an interesting claim. So um, this was written in 2021. Elsewhere in the video, Mike claims a by uh, Mike cites a claim by Belleville that Mary, Lymph Lydia, and Nympha were overseers of house churches. Um, and then Taryn agrees, stated in this form, the claim goes beyond the evidence which is cited, but there's more to say about Nympha. So that Mike agrees with Nympha that uh, Linda Belleville seems to. Um, either it was unclear or about what she was actually arguing or it wasn't a good argument, whichever. We will come back to Nympha later to see how her particular case can give us more help in assessing the claims that women churches became elders. What about Lydia? Mike indicates the unlikelihood of Lydia, a householder and businesswoman, becoming an elder of the church on the day she was converted. But he does not consider how matters may have progressed if the group of believers started to meet regularly at her house. Indeed, the growing number of believers who gather at her home appear to be the genesis of the Philippian church in Acts 16.40. There's nothing absurd about inferring that a regular host of a community of believers would become an elder of that church community if, because of lack of good character or some other reason, a person who was willing to host a church in their house was unsuitable for eldership it is reasonable to suppose that such a person would not be appointed and the church would not be would not regularly meet in their house. Mike does not cite any egalitarian who actually says or means that a host would be appointed as an overseer instantly and automatically. By misunderstanding Belleville, he sets up a strong man for knocking down. Reason number five. Why would Timothy and Titus need to appoint elders if the hosts of the church immediately became elders upon their conversion? This is a poor reason. So basically, he's saying that um, Timothy and Titus, the the passages, you know, First Timothy three and then and Titus one, they're they're giving a list of things that you need to do to appoint elders. But why would they need to appoint elders if the hosts of the church immediately became elders upon their conversion? So like, if if the church leader Sorry, if, if the, the person that like owned the house where all of the people were around and like, you know, if they automatically, the, the house owners, they automatically became the, the elder of the, the church home, why, why would Timothy and Titus need to appoint them later? That doesn't make any sense because anyone who owns a house would be the leader and we don't have to have to have other elders. Well, Terrence says this is a poor reason. We are not aware of any egalitarian scholar stating that a host would become an elder immediately upon conversion. Further, this reason presupposes that Timothy needed to appoint elders because there were already none already in post. So <clears throat> Mike's saying that the reason, or um, Terrence saying that this reason, what Mike's saying, presupposes that Timothy needed to appoint elders because they were none already in post. No. It's possible that there could have been other elders, but Paul didn't like them, as we will talk about. Paul's first letter to Timothy is written in about 63, 64 AD. But the Ephesian elders are already a recognized and functioning group before Paul meets with them at Miletus in AD 57. So I can almost guarantee you that these two dates for authorship are debated. So I would like to see some mention about if, if these two dates are debated. But uh, assuming that's true, there are two factors which drive Paul to give written instructions to Timothy about appointing elders. They are both connected with the crisis of false teaching, which Paul re returns to Asia to deal with when he is released from his first Roman imprisonment in about AD 62. At Ephesus, there are people in the church who desire to become recognized teachers, uh, but who are unsuitable. So Paul sets out written instructions about suitability to strengthen Timothy's hand in dealing with them. 
In addition, Paul has excluded two men who had been teaching falsely, who had probably been Ephesian elders. So it is possible that some new appointments are needed for that reason also. In Ephesus, the church has been in existence for a decade, so it is appropriate to say that elders should not be recent converts, 1 Timothy 3.6. A timeline of the Ephesian church can be seen in our discussion of Priscilla under topic 4 and part B of this article. There is a different situation in Crete where Titus is working. It appears that elders are needed in new churches, Titus 1.5. The luxury of not appointing relatively recent converts is not available, so Paul's instructions to Titus do not include anything about avoiding such appointments. This practice is cons consistent with other evidence. In Acts 14.23, we see Paul and Barnabas appointing elders in new churches where no one had been a believer for more than a matter of months. And um, this will help with that uh, further question about Acts 14. And historical evidence suggests that the apostles' usual practice was to appoint church overseers and deacons from among their first fruits, that is, their first converts in each town. Um, okay, yeah, that's interesting. So, First Clement 42.4, written about 30 years after Paul's letter to Titus, says that uh, the apostles' usual practice was to appoint church overseers and deacons from among their first fruits, that is, their first converts converts in each town so typically 400 500 600 maybe even 200 that's that's a little too far to to make conclusions not always but or to even like be helpful evidence but that's really interesting within 30 years and i i do wonder if that's even debated too i feel like dates are always debated but uh, yeah i mean if that's true that's that's huge um so none of this diminishes the practical pressures to appoint hosts as elders which we will explain below as reason number six, it is impossible that the host automatically became the overseer of the church if the host was an unbeliever. In principle, we agree with Mike on this. If churches met in households where the householder was not a believer, it would seem obvious that the householder would not be either the sole overseer or a... Uh, Clement was written either in AD 95 or around AD 65. Thank you. Um, whether there were in fact any such churches in another matter, Mike cites Romans 16, 10, 11, 14, and 15, and Philippians 4, 22. But he rightly does not claim that any of these verses actually show that a church was meeting in the house of an unbeliever. So this is a theoretical point rather than a substanti substantial one. We are not aware of any egalitarian author claiming that unbelievers' hosts became overseers. Reason number seven. There is a difference between having some authority and being overseer of the church. That, that is very correct. So this is going to be very important for his argument. Belleville writes, Offering one's home as a meeting place involved more than cleaning the house and making coffee. Homeowners in Greco-Roman times were in charge of all groups that met under their roof. This was essential since they were legally responsible for the group's behavior. And uh, e.g. Jason's responsibility to post bond, not unlike the fiduciary responsibilities of the chairperson of a board today. Mike examines Belleville's footnote 38, which refers to a book by Wayne Meeks. Meeks writes, The head of the household, by normal expectations of the society, would exercise some authority over the group and would have some legal responsibility for it. Mike makes a correct point that the phrase some authority does not necessarily mean becoming a church overseer. There are various possible degrees of authority. Nonetheless, it becomes clear that Mike has not understood the full intent of Mike's sta Meek's statement. Mike says that the responsibility of the householder is that like that in today's culture, by which he means in the contemporary Western world. This is historically wrong. The expectations of Greco-Roman societies were very different. Christian origin specialist Brian Capper says, the conventions of reciprocity and hospitality would have been broken if women householders were denied authority in the gatherings, which took place in their own homes. The extent of Mike's understanding will become clearer in our discussion of the next reason. His reason number eight, the normal expectation of the host's authority did not apply in the Christian church. Mike turns to the next page of Wayne Meek's book and says that the following is the most important quote. That hierarchy of Greco-Roman households offers no clue to the kinds of power and leadership that rival and prevail over the position of householder, either in the person of the itinerant apostle and his fellow workers or in the charismatic figures in the local group. Apparently, there were other models and social ideas at work. 
Um, so yeah, this is okay. So yeah, Mike's reading Wayne Meeks's book, and he's like he's pointing to this, and he's he's regards this quote as a knockout blow. He takes it to mean that Wayne Meeks refutes outright the egalitarian position. Oh my gosh, my, my computer's going crazy. Sorry guys, what is going on here? Okay, we're good here. Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah. So, so, like, he think he so he reads Wayne Meeks' book, and he's like, "Oh yeah, this obviously like it counteracts the egalitarian claims." He takes it to mean that Wayne Meeks refutes outright the egalitarian position that women householders who hosted churches probably became elders of those churches. Mike states with emphasis and repetition that the egalitarian is completely false. So he's making a very strong claim, completely false. Mike's message is that Linda Belleville has radically misunderstood Meeks' book. However, it is Mike who has radically misunderstood. And inadequate research has led him to misunderstand what Meeks is saying. Meeks certainly does not mean what Mike takes him to mean. How do we know this? There are two reasons. First, we should pay attention to the words, which Mike omits from the quotation, the omission is indicated by the dots, uh, which the, the quote is, it leaves unexplained not only the occasional expression of anti-hierarchical sentiments, but also the sense of unity among Christians in the whole city, the region or province, or even beyond. Meeks is painting a broad canvas. He's not confining his remarks about power and leadership to the context of an individual assembly in one household. He is concerned to understand how leadership functioned so as to produce a sense of unity in a whole city or even more widely. In this context, Meeks is flagging up that in addition to the responsibilities of the householder, there were other factors at work which helped to shape the forms of leadership found across the churches. The leadership function fulfilled by a single householder host does not explain the sense of unity in a whole city or more widely. Second, Meeks provides a cross-reference to his own writings elsewhere, where he concludes from the available evidence that women mentioned by Paul were in positions of leadership in local congregations. He mentions Priscilla, who was a church host, and says that with her husband she presided over her house churches. He adds that in Pauline circles, women could enjoy a functional equality in leadership roles that would have been unusual in Greco-Roman society as a whole and quite astonishing in comparison with contemporary Judaism. Therefore, Mike Meeks certainly, so don't, don't confuse Mike and Meek here, therefore Meeks certainly does not mean to contradict the idea that church hosts became elders. He gives Priscilla as an example of a woman host who, with her husband, presided over the church in her house. Out of fairness to Linda Belleville, Mike would do well to issue a correction of his portrayal of her understanding of Meeks' scholarship as radically defective, making clear that the radical defect of understanding was his own. Okay, so to summarize what's being said here, so uh, Mike questions the the quote from from Wayne Meeks and then he Mike looks at other parts of his book and he's like uh, clearly this other quote disconfirms what you think Meeks is saying here so clearly this you know this position by Linda Belleville is wrong because you know even Meeks disagrees with it and you're using Meeks evidence uh, but uh, Taryn goes to explain why hey uh, Meeks clearly does think that to be a leader in the home would be to, to be a leader in this church in at least many situations. So reason number nine, the example of Jason, Acts 17, 5 to 9, shows only that society holds the householder to be responsible for the group. It does not show that the householder is truly the leader of the group. Again, Mike's, Mike makes the elementary mistake of thinking that in the relevant respects, Greco-Roman culture was similar to today's Western culture. Uh, Jason had received Paul and Silas into his house in Thessalonica. Having given them hospitality, he was held legally responsible for their behavior when they preached in the synagogue and persuaded some of those who heard. Jason had to post a bond to guarantee their good faith behavior. Such a scenario is inconceivable in modern Western culture. If we host two traveling evangelists in our house, and they go out and address a crowd somewhere in the town, 
and their message upset someone, there is a possibility that the evangelists themselves might incur some legal liability under laws against hate speech or public order laws. But there is no possibility, no possibility that we thereby incur some legal liability on the ground that we hosted them in our house. The relevance of what happened to Jason is that it shows the heavy weight of responsibility placed on the householder by Greco-Roman society. Of course, it does not show Jason as the leader, but it shows why it would be natural for a householder host to be a leader of the hosted church. The hosting of the assemblies of a church week by week would involve potentially far greater legal responsibility than Jason incurred by providing temporary bed and board to two visiting preachers. In other words, like this is seems like just like a one-time thing, right? Or, um, you know, nothing on the level of like leading a church, but even in this, this small situation where, uh, what is it, Paul and Silas there, Jason even, like felt obliged to, to do that. All right, there's that responsibility would create a powerful practical imperative for the host to be an elder, whether on the house model or on the city model. To host the group regularly without retaining influence over what would be done would be to invite disaster. Moreover, the expectations of the patronage system should be kept in mind. The very fact of providing the venue would create a strong social obligation owed by the group to the host as patron to accept guidance from the host. All right, those practical pressures would be the same for a woman host as for a male host. For practical reasons, the woman host would need to be an elder. We are not suggesting that this must be inevitably have led to an invariable practice. Rather, there, there is a high probability that the host, whether man or woman, would become an elder. So we're going to look at the result of examining reasons one to nine. Almost done, guys. We have now reviewed my nine reasons for saying that the egalitarian claim about church hosts is not true, completely false, and serious, egregious scholarly error. Reason one is common ground on both sides of the argument. It is merely the starting point for the discussion. Reason number six is irrelevant. Reasons two, four, seven, and eight are based on misunderstandings by Mike. Reasons three, five, and nine are also wrong. So I think that includes all of it, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, yep, that's all of it. So either wrong, confused, or they actually agree. We have noted some shortcomings in egalitarian scholars' explanations, but our conclusion is that it is Mike who has made some substantial errors here. He has misunderstood Kohik. He has mistakenly depicted Belleville as misunderstanding Meeks through inadequate comprehension and inadequate research. He has unwittingly ascribed to Meeks in an understanding of women's participation in first century church leadership that is the opposite of Meeks' actual understanding. And Mike shows insufficient historical knowledge of first century culture. The above discussion shows that there is a strong historical probability that householders who hosted church gatherings, whether men or women, became members of a church eldership team, whether on the house model or on the city model. Women have hosted churches who Women who hosted churches would have been excluded from eldership only if the apostle laid down and clearly communicated a definitive and binding rule that no woman could become an elder. For only such a rule could realistically outweigh the powerful practical pressures which we have identified. But the apostles did not do so. And there is not and there is another piece of historical evidence which supports the conclusion that women church hosts probably became elders, but of which Mike makes no mention. Uh, let's look in a little more detail at Nympho, who hosted a church, Colossians 4.15. She was probably a wealthy widow. In the Greek text of Paul's letter to the Colossians, the grammatical form of her name could be that either of a man, Nymphas, or a woman, Nympho. Older English versions showed her name as masculine, Nymphas, and referred to the church in his house. That was because many Greek manuscripts referred to the church in his house, and scribes added accents indicating that the name was masculine rather than feminine. Sounds a lot like Junio. Uh, but, however, we now know that she was a woman, because the best extent Greek manuscripts of Paul's letter to the Colossians refer to the church in her house. This textual evidence is recognized in most modern versions of the Bible, including ESV, NIV, NET, and NRSV. If you're convinced in the ESV, NIV, and the NET, I think that's a pretty good basis, okay? That is because a change in the manuscripts from his to her is highly improbable, while a change from her to his is easily explainable. 
How did it come about that the earliest manuscript copies of Paul's letters said in her house, but some slightly later copies said in his house? How did she suffer this involuntarily, involuntary gender reassignment? A probable reason is not hard to find. Early scribes were well-versed in Greco-Roman culture. They lived in it themselves, albeit after Nympha's time. It is overwhelmingly likely that they knew that if someone hosted a church in their house, it would follow that the host was a church leader. But they believed that women could not be church leaders. So they corrected the original her to his in Capper's words. The scribes found Nympha's evident leadership role so scandalous that she was turned into a man, Nymphas, in parts of the textual tradition. Yeah, I'm a little skeptical of that specifically. Uh, I mean, just because they're close in time period doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, they they, ha they had a good position to, to know what's going on. Uh, a little more detail would have been helpful. Maybe it was extremely... I mean, the texts aren't, we don't have that early text, so yeah, I'm a little lost there. Anyway, so scribes who lived relatively close to Nympha in time and in culture found her leadership position evident. But Mike Winger in 21st century California does not find her leadership position evident. What do you think? Who is more likely to understand what it would mean to host a house church in the culture in which Nympha lived and in which Paul's letter was written? In this part A, we have considered Nympha and Lydia. In part B, we will go on to consider Priscilla and Phoebe, who are both named in Romans 16. Before summarizing our conclusions, these women are just a selection of those who are named in the scriptures as God's servants. We draw this part to a close by noting a remarkable imbalance in Romans 16. Among the many greetings to the Roman Christians, Paul commends for their work four named men and seven named women. Did he intentionally commend more named women than men as pushback against some in Rome who were Reluctant to recognize the value of women's ministry? We do not know. But the disproportionate naming of so many women in a letter that became Holy Scripture reminds us that God honors those who honor him. We should honor them, too. We gladly acknowledge the honor that is due to all those spirit-gifted and qualified women who presently serve as elders, pastors, or teachers in Bible-affirming churches around the world. All right. So, let's see here. Yep, so, that was a really interesting discussion, I would say myself um once again lots of comments made in the chat we'll talk about them later hopefully and uh maybe in the comments but anyway so it's been a pleasure talking with you guys and uh i'd love to hear your thoughts below uh, do you think that the the taryn williams and andrew bartlett made a strong enough case to show that overseers could be uh, or women could be overseers according to 1 Timothy 3. Not talking about 1 Timothy 2. Certainly plays a role in it, but you, we first have to figure out what 1 Timothy 3 says. Maybe maybe you can say it's ambiguous, but at, at the very best, um, if you have to rely on 1 Timothy 2, then you, you'd have to say it's ambiguous. Um, but anyway, so um, don't put too much meaning to those words right there. I, I uh, Spoke a little unclearly. That's okay. Anyways, so um, yeah. So what what do you think about First Timothy three, as well as the whole conversation about Nympha, women leaders uh, suddenly being overseers? I don't know sure how I feel about that at this point, uh, but we'll get that into another topic of a different day. Yeah, uh, make sure to like and subscribe. We'll be continuing this series. We still have to do part B, but otherwise it's been fun, guys, and I hope you have a good rest of your night or day or wherever you are.